गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन आप सभी का या मुंबई की ज्ञान सभा में स्वागत है आई वेलकम एवरीवन विल स्टार्ट दिस सेशन इन अनदर सेवन मिनट्स एट फोर थर्टी एंड आई एक्सटेंड अ डीप एंड वेरी वार्म वेलकम टू डॉक्टर रणदीप गुलेरिया जी डॉक्टर साहब थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर बींग विद टूडे एंड एंड वील कम इन टूडे प्रोसीडिंग्स वेरी शॉर्टली और ड्यूरिंग दी टॉक आई रिक्वेस्ट एवरी वन टू कीप देयर माइक्रोफोन्स ऑन म्यूट मोड आप सभी अपने माइक्रोफोन्स को म्यूट पे रखें और वीडियोस को भी म्यूट पे रखें सो दैट वी डोंट फेस एनी सॉर्ट ऑफ प्रॉब्लम्स वी विल बी स्टार्टिंग वेरी शॉर्टली बिफोर वी मूव ऑन टू टूडे सेशन वी लाइक टू शो वेरी शॉर्ट डॉक्यूमेंट्री विच विल गिव यू एन आइडिया अबाउट दिया एंड द काइंड ऑफ एक्टिविटीज दैट वी आर डूइंग so just uh, bear with us for for a minute and we'll shortly start असमंजस्व अवसाद की स्थिति से गुजर रही युवा पीढ़ी को दिशा देने का काम एक चिंता की कर सकता है वर्ष 2006 में देव संस्कृति विश्वविद्यालय के दीक्षांत समारोह में पूर्व राष्ट्रपति डॉक्टर ए पी जे अब्दुल कलाम व श्रद्धेय डॉक्टर प्रणव पंड्या जी जो विश्वविद्यालय के कुलपति भी हैं मिले और इन दोनों चिंतकों ने मंथन किया कि युवा पीढ़ी को एक सृजनात्मक मंच देने की आवश्यकता है जो राष्ट्र निर्माण में सहायक हो यहीं से दिया कि नींव रखी गई आई एम इंडी डिलाइटेड टू पार्टिसिपेट इन द सेकेंड कॉन्वेकेशन ऑफ देव Sanskriti Vishwa Vidyalaya I am very happy that this institution has been created with a motto of developing the divine culture which is of utmost important to us while we are on the path of transforming India into a prosperous happy and peaceful society we have the resp- की वापसी इसका परम उद्देश्य है इस तथ्य की महत्वता समझते हुए वो डॉक्टर
डॉक्टर कलाम के भारतवर्ष को वर्ष 2020 तक एक समृद्ध राष्ट्र बनाने के स्वप्न की ओर युवा शक्ति को अग्रसर करने के लिए दिया इस महान राष्ट्र के युवाओं के लिए एक आंदोलन है जो मजबूत सिद्धांतों और यथार्थवादी लक्ष्यों पर आधारित है जो लोग दिल और दिमाग से युवा हैं एवं जो एक नए भारत की परिकल्पना के हमारे स्वप्न से सहमत हैं उम्र जाति या धर्म की परवाह किए बगैर हमसे जुड़े मुझे विश्वास है गायत्री परिवार के दिया आंदोलन के माध्यम से देश के युवाओं में वो संवेदनाएं प्रकट होगी सामाजिक जिम्मेवार प्रकट होगी एक साहस की वृत्ति पैदा होगी कुछ करने के लिए कुछ कर करके दिखाने के लिए जीवन को लगाने की इच्छा होगी देश के लिए जीना सीखो इस मंत्र के साथ इस आंदोलन से जुड़कर आपके जीवन में खुशी एवं एक नए उत्साह का संचार होगा साथ ही अपने राष्ट्र को नई ऊंचाइयों तक ले जाने में आप गौरवान्वित महसूस करेंगे I welcome everyone on this Gyan Sabha platform today. आप सभी का इस Gyan Sabha के मंच पे स्वागत है और जैसा कि हमने इस वीडियो में देखा कि DIA that is Divine India Youth Association is a youth movement of all world Gayatri Parivar and is engaging youth into nation building constructive activities. And this Gyan Sabha initiative endeavor is a part of that nation building endeavor that we are moving ahead with. Uh, at the outset i will request everyone to pray for the well being of all particularly in in these troubled times where we are in main sabhi se request karunga ki mere sath aap ek universal prayer bolein for the well being of all we acknowledge the omnipresent omnipotent and omniscient almighty may the almighty help us in imbibing divine values and propel all of us on a righteous path this is in essence the crux of gayatri mantra इट इज ओम भूर्भुस्व तत्सवितुर्वरेण्यम भर्गो देव से धीम ही धियो यो न प्रचोदया लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वी आर एक्सट्रीमली ऑनर्ड टू हैव विद अस टुडे डॉक्टर रणदीप गुलेरिया पद्मश्री डॉक्टर रणदीप गुलेरिया जी हु वी नो फ्रॉम इज वेरी बिजी शेड्यूल हैज टेकन आउट टाइम टू बी विद अस टुडे ऑन दिस प्लेटफॉर्म एंड शेयर हिज थॉट्स फॉर अस ऑन दिस वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक दैट इज डी मिस्टिफाइंग कोविड नाइन्टीन Doctor Sahib, I welcome you once again, and and thank you so much for taking out time. I'll not take much time. I'll just take two minutes to set the theme for today's talk, and very briefly, uh, I'll I'll set out what do we intend to do here today. So we will talk, of course, talk about COVID and and the uh, impact it has had on um, on the entire world and and our country as well. Likewise, I'll briefly show two three slides to. Uh, Demonstrate what the uh, entire Gayatri Parivar, the establishment, and and uh, the youth wing have been doing uh, to counter this, and generally what are the activities. So DSVV Dev Sanskriti Vishwavidyalay is a university in in Haridwar, and as we saw in the video, Dr. Kalam went there on the second convocation, and along with Dr. Pranav Pandya, who is the chancellor of the university, they launched a youth movement which would give youth a platform to do these nation building activities. ESVB is reviving ancient wisdom and is confluencing it with modern science, and and is uh, committed to to uh, do research on a concept called yagyopathy. And there is a yagyaval ke center for yagy research which which was established in two thousand two thousand eighteen there, and it has been doing some pioneer work in the field of yagy how yagy therapy can be used along with modern science. and dsvv is working with the department of ayush as well and prominently in 2016 in in a health fair organized by the department of ayush dsvv demonstrated um, the literature on holistic holistic health yoga 
ayurved naturopathy punch gum etc as to how they can supplement the existing modern science and how we can explore uh, alternative means of medicine there have been two phd's um, in dev sanskriti uh, university and the, these uh, two phd's have been air quality modeling and non conventional solutions through vedic science some investigations into the chemical and pharmaceutical aspects of yogyopathy studies in pulmonary tuber uh, tb tuberculosis and these phd's have been sort of supported by uh, members of the central pollution control board and professors from the bioscience and bioengineering department of iit bombay who are uh, associated with this project as as co guides now the covid response when it comes to covid response uh, volunteers of all world gayatri parivar and um, uh, dia have been uh, engaged in uh, various activities such as distribution of food packets Uh, offering their uh, voluntary services at 5000 plus centers across world in addition to it gayatri parivar has a doctors group a nationwide doctors group which has doctors from various fields and they in normal times they organize health camps blood donation camps etc but in this troubled time of covid they have rendered their services selflessly which includes uh, treating patients for free wherever possible operating them for free wherever possible and providing all assistance that they can during these troubled times now center we centers have contributed uh, to state local bodies and the headquarters at shantikunj has donated 1 crore rupees to the state government of uttarakhand and as i said millions of food packets have been distributed facilitation and organizing corona checkups at some of the centers distribution of pp kits and masks gloves uh, throughout awareness webinars such as this one global prayers as i said because prayers have a strong psychological impact and there are special online webinars to uh, to deal with stress anxiety and negative feelings that a lot of us are experiencing during these troubled times and sublimation of special herbs in yagya for boosting immunity to to boost one's immunity these are some of the uh, responses that uh, all world gayatri parivar along with its uh, youth wing dia and chapters across the world have uh, given to covid and lastly there is a, a free online mental health helpline center at dev sanskriti vishwavidyalaya dev sanskriti university dsvv.ac.in where one can call and uh, and deal with all the mental health issues relating to covid and there is a free covid related ayurvedic consultancy as well which is uh, running at dsvv so this is what the background is the kind of work that all world gayatri parivar parivar is presently doing uh, for covid and today we are extremely delighted to have with us uh, uh, dr guleria padmashri dr guleria and i mean it's it's my duty to introduce him formally he's he's as we all know director of all india institute of medical sciences aims and he's consultant to international atomic energy iaea vienna on issues related to radiation protection he is associated with world health organization who as a member of its scientific advisory group of experts that is sage pulmonologist and the director as i said and he is credited with establishment of india's first center for pulmonary medicines and sleep disorders at aims quite a prolific profile and importantly uh, uh, dr saab is part of the covid response team uh, of, uh, of 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 our country and um, i mean we all of us have many questions and uh, doubts related to covid and i'm sure dr saab will address these doubts uh, um, as we go ahead so without wasting any further time i invite dr guleria uh, for his address today and to to guide us as to how should we deal with this problem and hum log kaise isse lade hain kaise iske jo misconceptions tarah tarah ke medium se aa rahe hain wo kya hain aur kaise hum tackle kare i very humbly invite dr saab Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prohit ji. And I'd like to first start by my sincere gratitude to the Gayatri Parivar and the Foundation for inviting me. And I am really impressed by the amount of work they're doing. And I think what this COVID has really shown us is how we all need to really 
get together and work together as a team uh, in terms of trying to look after our fellow men. It has also shown us the importance of what I call is holistic health. And this is something which our traditions uh, have been saying for a very, very, very long time. If you look at Ayurveda and our old traditions, whether it be a good lifestyle, whether it be having good values. And this is something which the pandemic has really brought to fore that if we were, if we have the normal good lifestyle in terms of our diet, in terms of our customs of um, hygiene, we can really combat COVID-19. Uh, also, I'd like to really say that uh, I'm very impressed by the social activities that the Gyan, uh, Gayatri Parivar is doing. I think it is very important at this time to support everyone, especially those who are marginalized. We must reach out and help them because this is the time where they are really going through a very uh, hard uh, phase in their life. And as was rightly said, that because of the lockdown and because of the fear of COVID, there is a lot of stress and mental health issues which we need to uh, reach out to. Children have, and, uh, have not gone to school for a long time. Social interaction has really uh, changed a lot. And I think this is something which has caused a huge uh, uh, alteration as far as uh, our own uh, lifestyle is concerned. So I think we need to really start developing strategies of how can we really change all of this. So I will now uh, just start by trying to uh, just try and put slide share on if I can get my slide share yes I hope you can all see my slides yes sir yes. We, are able, we are able to okay thank you very much so I shall be basically discussing about uh, COVID-19 and how do we demystify it. So basically, what is COVID? COVID is caused by a coronavirus which belongs to a large family of viruses. And this virus causes illness ranging from just what we call common cold, fever, cold, body aches to life-threatening pneumonias. There have been seven types of uh, viruses in this family which have been circulating and causing infection in humans. Uh, four of them are the ones which cause a mild illness like common cold, body aches, fever. But there have been three which have caused severe illness. So, these three, those are those those are four. severe acute respiratory syndrome, called SARS. SARS started in Southeast Asia, South China, Hong Kong. And then one patient who got the infection and went all the way to Canada, carried the infection to Canada, and there was an outbreak of COVID as far as Canada was concerned. Uh, but luckily, we were able to contain this uh, viral infection, and there was a good control, and this did not lead to a pandemic. We have another virus, which is known as Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, MERS coronavirus. This has been going on since 2012. We have been monitoring this very closely because this is a virus which happens in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia. And as you are aware, every year, many of uh, our uh, citizens go for the Hajj to that area. And because of that, there is always a concern that they may get the infection and bring it to our country and we may have an outbreak. Outbreaks from this have been reported in Europe, in South Korea and different parts of the world. But this virus also has not caused a large pandemic. SARS-CoV-2 is a new strain which was discovered in 2019 and this has caused a pandemic. When we talk pandemic, ki baat karte hai, then what do we understand by a pandemic? Why does a virus cause a pandemic? Two important things are there when we have this uh, virus. One is it has to be a novel virus, a virus to which mankind has never been exposed. And this usually happens when the virus mutates or when the virus jumps species. SARS coronavirus actually jumped species, it mutated, it jumped species, the origin seems to be from bat. MERS coronavirus, which we have in 2000, uh, which we have there, has probably a bat origin, but it jumped species through camel. And uh, uh, even for the SARS COVID, it is believed that it is also through uh, uh, bats or some wild uh, birds that it uh, jumped species. So, one is it has to be a novel virus. Second is that the virus has to have the ability of human to human spread. The virus should be able to spread quickly from one human to the other. 
And if it can do these two things, it is novel, so we have no uh, immunity to it, and it can spread quickly from one person to the other, it causes a pandemic. We had one pandemic in uh, which was H1N1, known as swine flu, but it was milder, and we got away with very few uh, deaths, and it did not cause such a lot of problem or disruption as far as SARS-CoV-2 is concerned. We've had pandemics in the past, mainly because of influenza, but this is the first pandemic which has happened to mankind because of coronavirus. So in 30, on 30th of January 2020, WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern. And in March of this year, it was actually characterized as a pandemic because it had spread to many countries and the cases had grown to a large extent. So the name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2 and the name of the disease is COVID-19. Why are we concerned? Because if you look at the global map, you will find that India has now started having a huge number of cases as compared to other countries. We were able to keep this down to a large extent because of the lockdown. But now the number of cases, if you look at this rolling seven day average, has increased significantly as far as India is concerned. And we were close to almost uh, a large number of cases, uh, close to one lakh cases a day. Also, as you can see, uh, as compared to the other countries, we are having a huge number of cases in terms of uh, newly confirmed cases. And this is also seeing a lot in America and in parts of South America also. Similarly, the number of confirmed deaths has also been on the rise. And therefore, this is also a cause of concern. And that is why we need to really see what we all as citizens can do to make sure that we can um, get over this pandemic and come back to a new or near normal life. Now, what is a virus? A virus is a pathogen that exists between the gray area between living and non-living. What does that mean? So the virus cannot survive without having a host. It goes inside the host cell, it hacks the host cell machinery and forces it to make copies of itself. What the virus does is it goes into the human cell using our uh, ACE2 receptors and then it hacks into our own machinery and then starts replicating. And that is how it spreads from one person to the other. It does not have the ability to be able to exist on its own. It's important for us to remember because this is how viruses spread. They are basically not classically living organisms as we would otherwise think them to be. Coronavirus is named uh, because of the fact that it looks like a crown and this is basically because of the spike glycoproteins and it resembles the solar uh, corona or the uh, when you have the eclipse and therefore the name of uh, it was given as far as coronavirus was concerned. The crown like appearance is due to projections called spike glycoproteins all over the envelope. So on the envelope you have these projections which you classically see and they look like the spike uh, like, uh, like a corona or a crown. So it spreads from person to person through respiratory droplets. And I'll come to this, which are produced when an infected person coughs or sneezing. And these droplets can land in the mouth or the nose of people who are nearby and possibly then enter the lung. This can also settle on surfaces like fomites. And this can also, one can get the infection by touching these fomites because then the virus comes to your hands and if you touch your face with your hands, the virus will quickly get transferred onto your face, your nose and mouth and cause infection. There's also a debate, ki, can, can this virus be occurring through inhalation route? And this is believed that it can happen, but it is not the, one of the major ways of transmission of this virus. Transmission can occur from asymptomatic individuals uh, also, and I'll come to that in some time. So when we look at this viral infections, we, we would look at what we call particle size and we look at the size of the particle. If you have a particle size which is more than 5 microns, then it, these are known as droplets. If the five, our particle size is less than 5 microns, we call them aerosols and we use this not only in uh, infection transmission, this is the, philo the basics of what we use uh, in our uh, 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 drug delivery as far as uh, inhalers are concerned, when we use inhalers for people who have asthma or bronchitis, we look at the particle side and we look at what is known as mass, median, aerodynamic uh, diameter and other uh, particle sizes because the dis deposition of the virus or drug to the lungs is dependent on particle size. If the particle size is very large, it just stays in the upper areas. Now, so in here, if the particle size is more than five microns, 
These are droplets and droplets are relatively more heavy. They cannot travel very far off because of their size and they quickly settle onto surfaces. Some of these droplets because of evaporation become smaller in size. They may stay in the environment and these are aerosols because they become less than five microns in size. So what happens is if you are close to someone who's coughing, these droplets can come onto your uh, surfaces or your face. If uh, you touch something which is close to the person, then also you can get the infection by touching this, uh, these things. This is something important to keep in mind. So if you look at various activities, and this is looked at by various studies, and this is that if you sneeze, large droplets tend to come down and fall, or, or fall, but the turbulent gas predominantly with aerosols can even travel up to a larger distance. On coughing, large droplets usually fall, usually two to three meters. The turbulent gas can go on also up to three meters, but beyond that, it tends, does not go very far off. So sneezing can lead to more uh, further distribution as far as aerosols or, or, or the virus is concerned as compared to coughing. While talking, it's uh, less. While you're talking, if you're breathing out some virus, the virus can come and these droplets can settle. And some of them can go as far as the aerosol is concerned. So important to keep in mind, transmission mode, droplet spread generated while coughing, sneezing, talking, and fomite spread through contact like doorknobs, handles, chairs, and tables. So this is just to give it in a cartoon fashion that if you have an infected person, he has virus in his throat, in his lungs, depending upon the size of the uh, particle and the distance and whether he's come in contact with fomites where the particles can survive for a longer period of time, you can have transmission happening as far as COVID-19 is concerned. Now we feel it is very contagious, but it's important to remember that the number of people COVID-19 which is known as also the R0, can infect is not as high as certain other viruses we've had in the past. For example, if an individual had measles, it's also a viral infection, that person actually infects almost 12 to 18 percent. Whereas if you have COVID-19, you usually uh, infect around 2 to 2.5 or 2 to 3 persons. And therefore, if we are able to isolate these individuals and make sure that they don't transmit the disease to others, we can break the chain of transmission. And that is why it's important to remember, like I said, the R0, that is how many uh, individuals can one person infect. And as you can see, as compared to others, COVID-19 has an R0 of 2 to 2.5. It uh, was about 1.2 to 1.6 as far as H1 was concerned. And for other viruses, it has been pretty high. For MERS coronavirus, it's 2.5 to 7.2. So therefore, it's important to remember that this virus is contagious, but it is still manageable in terms of the R0. But important to keep in mind that once you have an index case, if proper isolation is not kept in mind, this index case will then spread the disease to the household members. They will then spread it to the tertiary contacts, which is community at large. And uh, this is how we start having a cluster development in a locality on an area where one person who has got the infection from outside spreads it to other family members and these family members then, then because of other social contacts uh, spread it to other people and you start having a cluster of cases. Also, it's important to remember that majority of cases are mild or are asymptomatic and that's why they don't get picked up and that's why isolation and quarantine become all the more important. Cases with symptoms are lesser and then you have severe cases and death, and we always focus on that. But remember, the, the bottom of the pyramid, which actually is leading to the spread of the disease, is the mild cases or the asymptomatic cases, and we need to keep that in mind. So I think the most important thing in which I'll spend uh, time on first on focusing is prevention. What can we do to really prevent the spread of disease, and how can we help ourselves? So it has been shown that the strongest and most effective weapon the society has against the virus is the prevention of its spread. We must work as a team to prevent the spread of this infection. And currently there are no vaccine to prevent from COVID-19. We know how it spread. I've just tried to explain that to you. And the best way to pre uh, prevent illness is to avoid being exposed to this virus. And we know that it spreads through close contact through droplet infection, and also through touching infected surfaces. So there are three important pillars 
And if we follow these three important pillars, we can actually prevent the spread of infection. And these three important pillars are one is physical distancing. It doesn't have to be social distancing. It is more important to say physical distancing. And we must maintain a distance of six feet. As we open up the lockdown, this is becoming more and more challenging. And I think offices uh, or uh, workplaces have to develop strategy as to how can they maintain this distance. It could be uh, decreasing the number of people coming to office, having uh, different hours for people to come uh, or uh, m other mechanisms because we were never used to this issue of physical distancing and most offices were crowded, but that actually leads to spread of the infection. Third is to make sure that whenever we are touching surfaces or every two few hours, maybe every three hours, we wash our hands. That is something we need to keep in mind. So if you touch some surface which you feel you're not is not safe, please use a hand sanitizer or soap and water and wash your surfaces or make a habit of washing your hands regularly uh, uh, every few hours. And the third important pillar is all of us should wear a mask. And this is something also very, very important. So I will touch upon other uh, points also, six in general, but this these three are the most important that I would like to highlight on. And this is because, like I said, when you cough, if you start looking at the type of uh, particles which are generated through a cough, they can spread to a large distance and this is how the virus spreads. So this is something that I already discussed, that when you sneeze, there are infected droplets, they uh, infect your hands, and when you start touching people, the virus will get transmitted to you, or if you touch surfaces, the virus will get uh, uh, transferred to these surfaces, and this can lead to infection. So droplet infection and fomites is something that we need to keep in mind. And there are certain activities which are more at risk. If you, the lowest risk is if you're home alone or with your uh, just your family members, the moderate risk is outdoor because there is good uh, 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 wind and therefore chance of infection are less. Higher risk occurs if you're gathered in a crowd outdoors, that is a very high risk. And the highest risk is if you have an indoor gathering where there is not good, there is a, the cross ventilation is not good and you can get in, uh, a higher chance of infection. And that is why in offices or other places, you must keep your windows open. You must make sure that there is good cross ventilation so that even if you have an asymptomatic person who is infected, the infection doesn't stay in the air for a long time and you are all wearing masks. So the six steps, one is hand sanitizing. Hand wash with soap and water is very important or you can use an alcohol-based alcohol hand rub. And you must use 20 to 40 seconds. People would say 40 seconds. And this is basically uh, that you must uh, wash your hands taking that much time. I've just highlighted various uh, important uh, times when you must wash your hand and keep these in mind, whether it be preparing food, coming from the restroom, leaving a public place, blowing your nose, coughing and sneezing, or caring for someone sick, all of these are important issues and you should avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth. These are the steps which are very important for hand washing. It's not a simple thing that you just wash your hand. It's very important to see that the front, the palm of your hand, the back of your hand, the thumb, the area between your fingers and also your nails are properly washed. And that is something that we need to keep in mind. And that is also there when you're using a hand sanitizer. I'll see if this video Haan runs. Ke vidhi mein, aapko lagbhag 40 se lagenge. Gehne, ghadi aur nikal Pehle ko pani se gila karein, ab sabun dono mein achche se male. I hope you can see the video. Apne yeah, this is visible, sir. कि ऊपरी सतह से दाएं हाथ की हथेलियों को मले ऐसा दूसरे हाथ के साथ भी करें अपनी उंगलियों से दोनों हाथों के बीच में मले अपने हाथों की दाएं और बाएं हथेलियों को आपस में मले अब अपने बाएं हाथ के अंगूठे को दाएं हाथ से घुमाकर मले ऐसा दूसरे हाथ के साथ भी करें अपने बाएं हाथ की हथेली की मुट्ठी बनाकर अपने दाएं हाथ की हथेली के ऊपर रखकर पीछे से और आगे से मलें और ऐसा दूसरे हाथ के साथ भी करें हाथों को साफ पानी से धोएं और सूखे तौलिए या पेपर टॉवल से सुखाएं नल बंद
लिए उसी तौलिए का इस्तेमाल करें आपके हाथ अब साफ और सुरक्षित हैं so this is just to give you an idea of how to wash your hands keep i uh, this is also available on our website and you can look at uh, this uh, video which is both in english and hindi to really give you an idea of how to wash your hands but also once you do that try and avoid touching your eyes nose and mouth remember if you're if you're if there is infection on your hands but you don't bring them to your face then the infection cannot reach your airways and you cannot get infected so we must make try and make it a habit of avoiding to touch our eyes nose and mouth uh, there are a lot of questions which people ask should i be using antibacterial soap to wash my hands really not needed if you use plain soap and water that is sufficient if i add alcohol to a non alcohol hand sanitizer will this be better to prevent covid 19 not really required addition of alcohol to an existing non alcohol hand sanitizer is unlikely to result in activated product you have to use an alcohol based hand sanitizer and can we keep hand drops in the car yes you can keep hand drops in the car in a cool and dry environment away from sunlight and that is something that can be done second important step is to cover your mouth and nose uh, 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 regularly and this protects us from getting infected when we are in office or in workplace the mask is meant to protect other people in case you are infected and it also protects you in case other people are infected so everyone should wear a mask in public setting and when around people especially when other social uh, other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain and you should not use a mask meant for healthcare workers a simple cloth mask is good, good enough but i think this is very important that all of us regularly wear a mask when we are outside somehow this behavior has actually come down over the last few weeks and we have stopped wearing masks as sincerely as we used to i'll just try and show you why it is important if you have an infected asymptomatic person if that person is not wearing a mask then while talking coughing that person is spreading uh, viral particles of different sizes now if you are a healthy person is wearing a mask he is protected to some extent if the person both people are not wearing a mask this person will definitely get infected now if both the person who is infected but asymptomatic and the healthy person are wearing a mask then there is minimal exposure because the chance of the virus coming into the environment and then being inhaled by the uh, healthy individual is very very low therefore this is something that we need to keep in mind that mass reduce airborne transmission and we must therefore be aggressive in containing the infection by everyone wearing a mask and this is how many countries have actually managed to do it whether we talk of south korea taiwan or even uh, vietnam the cases have come down basically by using a mask and it's been calculated and estimated that if everyone in the community wore a mask we could bring down the number of cases by almost 30 to 40% that's a huge number and that will translate to decree a lesser number of hospitalization lesser number of deaths so i think mask wearing a mask is something we need to aggressively promote among our fellow citizens it's important how to wear a non medical mask this is the steps uh, which basically highlight that that you must inspect the mask to make sure it's not damaged or dirty you must adjust the mask so that it covers uh, both your nose uh, mouth and uh, uh, and your chin and you must make sure that this is uh, fits you tightly there is no gap between the nose and the mask or or between the side because you want that there should be no air coming in from the side of the mask otherwise it will actually be uh, less effective so it's important to keep these uh, steps in mind and important don'ts also that don't use a mask when it's damaged don't wear it loosely i see a lot of people who wear mask but they don't cover their nose that is ineffective you must must cover your nose and mouth and also try and be careful that you are you remove it properly using the um, strings or the which hold the mask rather than catching the mask uh, with its cover also cover your cough and sneeze whenever you're coughing and sneezing i showed you the uh, initial video uh, diagram that when you cough and when you sneeze the virus can travel for a very long distance therefore always cover your mouth and nose with tissue or with your uh, with uh, even a handkerchief which you can then wash and and use that uh, to cover your uh, cough and sneeze 
if you don't have a handkerchief for this thing, cough into your arm, uh, arm or your elbow. That will also prevent the spread of infection to others. So cover your cough and sneeze. That is something we must always keep in mind. Then social distancing, uh, which is physical distancing. I've already talked about this, but we must have a physical distancing of six feet or about two arm lengths. And this is very important to in public and outdoor places. And if this is um, done along with wearing a mask and hand washing, I think we will have won our battle against COVID-19. So keep uh, keep this in mind, especially before you go, when you're going traveling out in public transport, when there is uh, uh, you're traveling to stores, selling household goods, and be careful. And uh, as far as activities are concerned, it's better to look at video conferences uh, rather than going into a crowded place and try and keep as much physical distancing as possible. This is something that we need to keep in mind that uh, we know how this infection spreads and by keeping physical distancing, we will be able to prevent the spread of this infection. Avoid touching people. This is something we have to be very careful about. This is changing times and as we used to do in the past, we should meet everyone with folded hands rather than shaking hands. This will also help in, in a long way as far as spread of the infection is concerned. Now, do, ma do masks uh, work and does physical distancing work? So this is a study which was published in Lancet in June, which did a systemic review and a meta-analysis trying to see that does physical distancing, face mask, and eye protection really help. And they looked at 172 studies across 16 countries and looked at almost 25,000 uh, more than 25,000 healthcare and non-healthcare settings. And what they found was that if they looked at physical distancing, it was definitely helpful. This is the forest plot. We showed that transmission of virus was lower phys with physical distancing of one meter or more compared with a distance of less than one meter. They also looked at face masks and face mask uh, use could result in large reduction in the risk of infection. This was based on the analysis of the large number of studies and they also showed that a greater reduction with N95 or similar respirators compared to disposable surgical masks. Remember, they looked at a large number of people who are healthcare facilities. And that's why if you look at the setting, there's a large number of healthcare settings that this has been looked at. They looked at high protection also in a healthcare setting and eye protection was associated also with less infection. So now there is a lot of evidence that these things work. It is only that we have to start doing that. And that is why I think these three things which I keep on stressing upon are very, very important. The fifth thing is clean and disinfect your surfaces. And this is something you should do about frequently touched surfaces. It could be tables, it could be a doorknob, it could be light switch, it could be a countertop. Make sure that in offices or in places where there are a number of people coming, that these uh, surfaces are regularly, once every few hours, cleaned with a disinfectant so that which virus cannot uh, survive there for a long period of time. We know that on surfaces, especially metal surfaces or even on uh, wooden surfaces, the virus can survive for hours. Therefore, don't think that you've, uh, you've, uh, uh, no one has come and therefore uh, in the last two hours, the virus, you can touch the doorknob. The virus may have been there for, uh, for quite some time. And if surfaces are dirty, clean them, you can use detergent, uh, detergent or soap and uh, and water prior to disinfecting them so there are these are uh, very important things that you can do and that uh, you can use uh, simple diluted bleach solution that is one part bleach to 99 parts water if the surfaces cannot be cleaned with bleach 70 percent ethanol can also be used and toilets and bathrooms should also be cleaned and disinfected with bleach, bleach solution you can use a disposable glove while doing this cleaning so that your hands are not infected if you can't do that make sure that once you've done the cleaning, you thoroughly wash your hands so that you do not, your hands do not get infected. The sixth step, which is the final step, is monitor your health daily. This is something we have to do during the pandemic. So be alert for symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath, or other symptoms of COVID-19. And if you have any of these symptoms, then it's very important that you stay away from office or workplace or uh, make sure that you don't be the source of infection in your own office or workplace. Take your temperature if symptom develops, and this is something that you need to do. Don't take your temperature within 30 minutes of exercising or after taking medication or having a hot cup of tea. You should take your temperature, which would be the normal temperature in the mouth. And if you have any features 
of COVID-19, please don't be reluctant to get your testing done as early as possible. We have the rapid antigen test, we have the RT-PCR test, and we have the TrueNAT and the CBNAT test also. Now I'll briefly give you an overview. I know that a lot of you are not clinicians of the pathophysiology and the clinical features so that you get an, an idea of what is this virus all about. Now, the important thing to remember is that this is the virus, and I've told you why it's called coronavirus. It enters uh, our body through uh, what it does is attached to the ACE2 receptors and the Tempress receptors. These are present on a large number of cells in our body. And that's why this virus can affect so many parts of our body because ACE2 receptors are present in the upper airways in the lung, but they're present in the intestine, they're present in the kidneys, and they're present in various other organs. So once it gets attached, it has a direct cytotoxic effect. Then it causes dysregulation of what is known as the retic reticuloendothelial, uh, you know, the aldosterone uh, system, the RA, RAS system, uh, and the, and this uh, basically through angiotensin one conversion leads to dysregulation and causes vasoconstriction and vascular permeability. It can also lead to endothelial, that is the lining inside the blood vessels damage and thromboinflammation, that is inflammation or clot formation. And this can lead to inflammation and thrombosis. And then later on, it can lead to dysregulation of the immune system leading to what is known as cytokine release syndrome. So number of uh, ways this virus can be uh, uh, cause uh, problems and uh, by the cytotoxic effect, by the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, by endothelial damage and by causing a cytokine release syndrome. Like I said, this can infect large parts of the body. We know that it predominantly affects the lungs, but it can have a neurological effect. It can affect the kidneys. It can affect the liver. It, some patients can present only with diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, loss of taste. It can lead to a hypercoagulable state. A lot of clotting ha happens. And we have patients who have suddenly collapsed because of a huge clot which may have formed in the lung. It can lead to cardiac involvement like uh, uh, myocarditis, cardiac arrhythmias. Some of our patients are pre presented with very low heart rate, bradycardia. It can lead to endocrine problem and there are patients who present with skin manifestation leading to dermatological problem. So it is truly a multi-system involvement rather than just a lung involvement as certain other viruses are known to cause. Also important to remember that when you have infection, you have what is known as a latent period, after which you become uh, infectious. But remember, this is the incubation period. So even before you develop symptoms, you are infectious. And it has been shown that almost two to three days before you develop symptoms, you are infectious. So if I was to have had the infection uh, at, at point day zero, I would develop fever on day five, but I would start shedding the virus and spreading the virus to others on day three, day four, and by day five. That means even in what we call the pre-symptomatic stage, you are infectious, and that is why this virus spreads so much. So this is very fascinating. The virus enters your body. It starts invading your cells. It starts multiplying inside your body, in your nose, and it starts shedding and spreading to others but it has knocked out your immune system and you don't respond to it. If you had an infection, your body should respond to it with some symptoms. It could be fever, it could be body aches, it could be running nose, but this virus knocks out that system. And for two days, you are actually sort of held, I, could, I would say hostage by the virus to spread the disease, not develop any symptoms till it has spread to other people. And that's why this is a very dangerous virus. So when you look at the clinical profile, you can have an asymptomatic people who are having no symptoms. The virus is in their nose, but the virus has knocked out their uh, system so that they don't present any symptoms, but they are spreading the infection. And a large number of people, it's estimated could be more than 40%. Some studies suggest it could be 80% are asymptomatic, but they are spreading it to others who may become symptomatic and have severe illness. Then you have the pre-symptomatic stage, which I just mentioned. You can have mild illness, moderate illness, severe illness, which can lead to pneumonia. You can have complications like ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, sepsis, and you can have atypical presentation because like I said, the virus can affect other organs, cardiac, neurological, gastrointestinal, and that's important to keep in mind. 
symptoms we know that majority of time people will present with fever, respiratory symptoms, fatigue, body aches, diarrhea can occur, and the loss of taste and smell can also be reported in some individuals. Now, most people, 80% will have mild infection, 15% have moderate infection, and 5% go on to have severe infection in the form of a cytokine storm. The problem is we're not able to predict who will go from one stage to the other, and this is the biggest challenge that we have, that you may have an individual who has mild infection, on the sixth or seventh day, he may suddenly have his oxygen saturation falling, his x-ray showing a patch, and then suddenly he goes into severe pneumonia and then goes into the cytokine storm. There are certain parameters which suggest that there are some individuals who are more prone to severe disease and those who have heart problems, including hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, who are obese, who are, whose body weight is more, who are immunosuppressed, and those who have underlying malignancies. And this is a chart just to show that if you had no comorbidities, your mortality is less than 1%. But with all the comorbidities, the death rate actually goes up. And that is why we keep arguing that we have to uh, try and improve, uh, try and protect our um, uh, high risk group, which is the elderly and those who have comorbidities. Mild cases, we are still saying you need to be on home care or in a COVID care centers, and I won't go into the uh, treatment strategies, but we need to see how we can have less uh, stress or strain on the hospital. So those who have mild cases and recover on their own are kept in COVID care centers or home isolation, but are closely monitored. Because like I said, we don't know how each individual will behave and some can deteriorate and we should have the a uh, way of monitoring them so that we can quickly shift them into our hospitals. The treatment predominantly is supportive. There are antivirals that we give. Uh, some of them are uh, given for moderate to severe disease like remdesivir. Some which have less evidence are given for mild disease, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, dox doxycycline, and uh, uh, favipavir. These are drugs which have shown some benefit, but the data is not that strong. Oxygen therapy is some of one of the most important treatment strategies because when they have hypoxemia, if you can correct their oxygen and maintain their oxygen, gradually they start recovering on their own with supportive treatment and they come out of this severe illness. We know that this causes now increased clotting as I showed in the pathophysiology and therefore anticoagulation is an important strategy. And in some patients who go into the cytokine storm, anti-inflammatory drugs like tocizolimab are important also. This is just to give you the time course. When you start having an illness, this black line is the illness. As you go along, you start off with stage one, which is early infection where you have a large viral load, but this gradually starts coming down. And 80% of people will get stopped at this dotted line. They will not progress further and will come all right with supportive treatment and with some antiviral drugs. The remaining 15 to 20% may go on to stage two, which is a pulmonary phase, where they have shadows in their X-ray, they start having a fall in oxygen saturation. If they require high oxygen saturation, they go on to stage two B. In these patients who start having deterioration, steroids are given, and there is now a lot of data, especially uh, good trials and meta-analysis, which shows the steroids actually have a mortality benefit. They save lives. We also give anticoagulants because, like I said, they, there's increase in clotting. We give antiviral drugs like remdesivir. And in some patients, we also give convalescent plasma. This is all given only in this stage. Again, most patients uh, will stop at this dotted line. Less than 5% will go on to what we call the hyperinflation phase of the cytokine storm. And only in these patients do we give anti-inflammatory therapy like anti-IL-6 therapy, a drug known as tocizolimab. It's important to remember that if we started this anti-inflammatory treatment early, we will actually be causing more harm than good because we want the body's host immune response to work and kill the virus rather than suppressing it by giving anti-inflammatory drugs early. And that is why timing of treatment is very important when it comes to managing these patients with COVID-19. What what about the, the, uh, the uh, doing tests uh, subsequently? And this is one study which looked at in SARS-CoV-2 uh, from diagnostic sample. 
and they looked at 19 RT-PCR positive samples, but only 26 patients had viral culture and no positive cultures after eight days or if the CT value was high. What this tends to show was that normally after the eighth to tenth day in asymptomatic people, your RT-PCR may be positive, but you are shedding non-viable or dead viruses and the virus is now no longer active in your body. And that is why it's not something that we should follow up patients with regular RT-PCR because it may be just being, the vi RT-PCR picks up the viral material. It doesn't see whether the virus is viable or not. And you may pick up uh, the viral material uh, by the RT-PCR, which is a uh, dead virus. This is something that we had also looked at and highlighted that uh, the real-time RT-PCR uh, does not, positive does not apply infectivity. And that is why the guidelines got changed. The Indian guidelines now, and for instance, June, suggest that asymptomatic in individuals, patients with mild symptom and moderate symptom do not need to get a test done before discharge. They may continue isolation after, and they may be sent home after seven days of a positive report if they're asymptomatic, or 10 days uh, of onset of disease and with no symptoms for three days, whichever is earlier. And in, the, in moderate disease also, they can be uh, discharged without having a test done. In only those who are whose immunity is low or who have serious illness should one really do, do one test to make sure that they are negative because in immunocompromised people like HIV positive patients or patients with underlying uh, malignancy, they may be a, they may shed viable virus for a longer period of time, and this is based on a lot of scientific studies which have recently come in. Coming to one issue of herd immunity, we talk of vaccination and then. Of infection. Herd immunity is if 60 to 70 percent of people were infected and by that uh, way they would not be able to, they would break the chain of transmission and not be able to, uh, we would have lesser and lesser number of cases. For how long this herd immunity will last without the vaccine because we're not sure how long the type of neutralizing antibodies uh, stay and whether they are enough and vaccination is one policy. Then I'll so we have different timelines as far as vaccine is concerned and if you can look at if you look at the timelines for various vaccines it has taken decades for a vaccine to develop but for the uh, covid 19 we are actually developing a vac vaccine at very rapid speed and therefore if you look at traditional vaccine development program it takes multiple years phase one phase two phase three and pre um, that is preceding that as a pre-clinical development and licensure what is being done right now is that we're looking in parallel. We started doing phase one and phase two and three studies in uh, simultaneously. We also started large scale production and getting license done so as to bring this down. There is an interest in what is known as human uh, challenge studies where a hybrid model can also be used, uh, which is known as controlled human infection model. Uh, the what it means is that once you've done a vaccine trial in phase one and you've shown an early phase two that is shown that this vaccine is effective you in fact you give it to people who are having a chance of getting infection and see how much protection it gives them and therefore they are the ones who become volunteers and get infected but you have not done all your studies and therefore the, this is a human challenge trial this is ethical issues but this is being looked at by in certain centers in UK. Can we look at these trials? Because this will further shorten the timeline for the vaccine to be available. A large number of vaccines are there. This is just to give you a list which was there on 20th of August, where you can see that we have a huge number of vaccines uh, from different areas. Many of them are from the UK, from US, and from China. We also have vaccines from India. We have the Catilla Healthcare Limited the DNA plasmid vaccine, the Bharat Biotech, the whole viron inactivated vaccine, the Serum Institute of India along with uh, the Oxford the group uh, and AstraZeneca is also developing their vaccine. And there are additional 139 vaccines in preclinical trials. Finally, I'd like to just focus that COVID is not only uh, a disease where you get all right, there is what we call post-COVID sequelae. And we're realizing more and more that many patients who recover from COVID continue to develop damage in various parts of the body, which can be long-standing. Some of them recover quickly in three to six weeks, but in some, they can be lung fibrosis, which can mean that they need oxygen for a long period of time. 
Some of them have uh, cardiac involvement, so the heart functioning becomes weak. Some people have had stroke. And this is just to tell you that a large number of organs can be involved as part of COVID-19, which can lead to even post-COVID sequelae. And we have started now look, running clinics to look after these patients. This is a study which was published uh, in JAMA, which looked at post-COVID persisting symptoms. And what they found was, and they looked at patients at two months, two months after they had recovered, that only 18, that is 12%, were completely free of any COVID-19 related symptoms. That is more than 80% of individuals had some symptoms as a post-COVID follow-up. Many of them had symptoms which were mild, fatigue, dyspnea, joint pains, chest discomfort, persisting dry cough. None had fever or any illness of acute illness, but some of them had lung fibrosis, which required oxygen at home or breathing problem. And in what 44% it lead to poorer quality of life. Therefore, I think we are looking at not only COVID, but post COVID sequelae, because that is going to be also a huge challenge. Just quickly run through myths, which we have one at a time. One is that this has been around for a long time. It's not a new disease. We know that this belongs to the coronavirus family, and this is a new virus. It's a novel virus. Uh, does it uh, does this infect older people and are the younger people also susceptible? This virus can affect everyone. All ages can be infected. Older people can have more severe disease. Is wearing um, a glove uh, protective? I, I uh, or is uh, um, uh, uh, let me see. Is wearing rubber gloves uh, while out in public effective? Really not. You must wash your hand, wash your hands because sometimes wearing gloves gives you a false sense of security, and that can at times cause problems. Keeping your AC switched off, and this is something which a lot of people have worried about. Window ACs and home ACs can be used and are safe as long as there is good ventilation. There should be good air exchanges. When we're looking at big building and central AC, you need to be cautious. You must make sure that there is good air exchanges. The vents are open and fresh air comes in, or you should open a window so that there is good air exchange. And that's because, like I said, some of the virus can be aerosol and may stay in the indoor environment. And either you can have an open window that it goes out, there has to be good ventilation, or use filters or a UV lamp when you're using recycled air because this can lead to infection transmitting uh, to various parts and therefore recirculation should be avoided if possible. Should we give up our pets as they may transmit our uh, virus to us? That has not been shown to be true. Why, you should not abandon your pets. If you are symptomatic, maintain physical distancing from pets too. You can transmit the infection to pets. It's an important thing to remember. Taking a hot bath will not prevent you from catching COVID-19. Important to remember because many people feel that if they take a hot bath, they can get protected. It is it will not really protect you as far as COVID-19 is concerned. Can gargling uh, mouthwash protect you from infection? Uh, and uh, there is really no evidence that mouthwash will protect you from infection with new coronavirus. Uh, same, same thing is regarding as far as uh, drinking very hot water uh, is concerned. Really no data to suggest that drinking hot water will also protect you as far as the virus is concerned. Is it safe to get letters and pa packages from outside? And this was basically what people are worried about China, but it is actually safe to receive packages as long as you are making sure that you open them properly and wash your hands while you handle packages. So you have a package, you open it, take the content out, dispose of the outer part of the package and wash your hands properly. That is protective. Similarly, smoking have an effect on the new coronavirus. There's enough evidence to suggest that smoking is not protective. As a matter of fact, smoking can cause more problems. It may actually increase the chance of more severe infection. And if you are a smoker, this is a good time to quit smoking. Drinking alcohol will kill the virus in your throat and prevent infection. This was basically because people argued that if you were able to kill the virus using an alcohol-based hand wash, then you should, if you were to gargle with alcohol, it will kill the virus. It's important to remember that the virus in the body is inside cells. And by gargling your mouth, you will, the alcohol will not go inside the cell and you will not be able to kill the, kill the virus. Herbal and homeopathic remedies. 
again not much evidence in general a good balanced diet green leafy vegetable fruits are good for health i would say regular exercise and yoga is something that we must do there is a lot of data which suggests that that helps and boosts your immune system and therefore that is something that you should follow up uh, as far as uh, rinsing your nose with saline is concerned again not much evidence to show that this is helpful and therefore it's not really something that is advocated uh can this uh, new coronavirus uh, be transmitted in hot and humid climates i think we know that it can because despite the summer that we've had the covid-19 in our part of the world did not show any decline and exposing yourself to high temperature will not also protect you from covid-19 and many people say that if i buy medicines should i keep them in the sunlight for an hour to kill the virus before using them sunlight will activate viruses in general but we don't need to panic so much we can bring the medicines home and in and in an envelope discard the envelope and keep the drug strips with you it is actually safe to do that what we've done is we've tried to compile a lot of these things through various booklets we have this booklet which we've made in english and hindi for covid-19 be careful not fearful uh, this was released in mid march and something that is available on the net we've had covid-19 portal also and if you're interested uh, the videos that i showed and many other videos are available we've had other videos which are basically looking at stigma how to wear ppes how to use a reuse masks what the elderly should do and i would encourage those who are interested to really have a look at these videos and the webinars that we've had we've done more than 50 webin webinars for healthcare workers and for the general public we also have a helpline and this is something that one can reach out to if there is any doubts that you have the contact covid-19 national teleconsultation helpline now finally we made it through worse so we need not worry but we need to be careful and this is what i'm going to show to you that what happened in 1918 and 19 more than 100 years ago more than 100 years ago it was estimated that 20 to 50 million people worldwide died and this was in the, in the era where antibiotics were not available we did not have that much of research collaboration was not of that high grade there was a huge number of deaths in the us as a matter of fact since 1900 till today the only time that us life expectancy has fallen or gone shown a downward trend was during the spanish flu or the 1919 pandemic this uh, pandemic also came in three waves and if you uh, the, after the first wave people start stopped uh physical distancing wearing masks and this led to a huge increase in the number of cases in the second wave and a subsequent third wave also happened if you look at data from india this is data from india of 1918 and we had a huge number of deaths we had mortality in influenza in 1980 was 7 million people died remember the population of india in 1920 was only around 389 million and this is data from the sanitary commission with the government of india during the british time And, and the mortality was pretty high at that point in time if you look at photographs of 1918 it reminds us of today this is a gymnasium which was converted into a hospital in 1918 flu pandemic and as you can see there is physical distancing between beds there are sheets between beds and all the people there are wearing masks then also public gathering places were ordered closed by leaders in many major cities uh, there was a shortage of caskets because of the increasing number of deaths and all police officers also wore masks masks actually became fashionable during that time and this was something that was done by many people in europe because this was felt it is important to uh, wear to decrease the, the spread of infection even uh, the issue of physical versus uh, uh, social uh, distancing was important and therefore it was arg argued that when you are in quarantine you should still stay in touch with each other and at that point in time we didn't have our mobile phones so landlines were useful and this is an advertisement by the new york telephone company saying that you should stay in touch even during 1918 with your near and dear ones uh, while in quarantine and schools churches this about 100 years ago we had written an editorial about this uh, in 1918 uh in sort of in 2018 when we in 2018 when we were having 100 years of the pandemic and we had really highlighted that we are going to have another pandemic and india is as vulnerable as it was 100 years ago so thank you very much i would just like to conclude by saying the future depends on what we do today thank you
Thank you so Thank much, you. Uh, Dr. Bulia, for that very lucid and and simple presentation. In fact, uh, we've got so much feedback on this that you explained it simply and you cleared the myths. That is extremely encouraging and helpful. Uh, now, uh, I've got certain questions from the audience, uh, sir, and and with your permission, I'll put those questions to you. In fact, many questions have already been answered by you during your. Uh, 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 your your discourse and you clarified a lot of things which we sort of uh, infected. So it, it's in, in case of an asymptomatic patient, it's a challenge that uh, that we how do we recognize or the symptoms or or how do we uh, assess the situation? So uh, I'll take a few questions subject to uh, your availability of time, sir. And and one very important question that a lot of people have in mind. And in fact, we have got this repeated times. Is is the CT value? I mean, how important is is the CT threshold, particularly when a patient cannot go out and is being treated remotely? What's the significance, and 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 what exactly does it entail? So there has been a lot of controversy as far as CT value is concerned. CT value means cycle threshold. And this looks at the value once you do your nasal swab or the RT PCR test. If your CT value is low, that means you have a higher, higher viral load. If your CT value is high, that means you have a lower viral load. So it was felt that if your CT value is less than 20 or 24, then you have very high viral load. And if your CT value is more than 24 or 28, you have less viral load. And therefore, it was interpreted that it could mean two things. One is that you have mild, you will get milder illness. And secondly, that you will be less infectious. So if your CT value is high, you have less viral load. And it was felt that can this tell us that you are less infectious and you are having a less severe disease. However, this there are two or three things to remember. One, a lot of studies show that the CT value does not correlate with the severity of illness. So you can have a CT value which may be 25, 26, low viral load, but you may go on to develop a severe illness. The reason why this is important is that you do a nasal swab at a given point in time. The virus is evolving. You may have done it at a time when the viral load has not peaked. And therefore, you will get a CT value which may show a low viral load. But maybe if you were to repeat that nasal swab 24 or 48 hours later, your CT value will be different because now the viral load has become different. So looking at one CT value does not tell you how the virus is behaving over a period of time and what your actual viral load would be. And that is why it cannot really tell you about infectivity or seriousness of illness. Sometimes people use it to follow up to see that now my um, CT value was 20, now it's gone up to 26. So it means that I'm improving. Again, data is not there to show this. So I think we should not really give too much of importance to the CT value. The next question is is uh, in respect of uh, now we see at places such as Mumbai or or other metros where people live in very congested conditions, and it may happen that the entire family uh, gets the virus. How do they cope up? How do I mean? How do they manage their food? And is is something which is is a logistical problem also? But how do they address the medical emergency? particularly when they are asymptomatic and they have to take care that it does not spread to the neighborhood, etc. So I think the important issue here is that if you everyone in the household is infected, then still it's a little simpler issue because then you don't have to have isolation between one member of the family as compared to the other. On the other hand, let's take a situation where one fair person is infected, others are negative. Then you have to have very strict isolation in place so that that individual who is infected doesn't infect the other members of the family. So you have to develop a, one person has to be the caregiver. The person who is infected has to stay in one room with an attached toilet and he should confine himself to that area. The food that is given should be given by one person who can leave it outside and this can be picked up so that the physical distancing is maintained. Utensils should be separated and uh, uh, cleaned uh, separately. And you must always wear a mask. Everyone inside should wear a mask so that the infection is not spread. And this person should make sure that all surfaces are cleaned using a disinfectant. 
so that type of uh, st uh, can be done this is also available on various websites including the ministry's website of what is the home isolation method but the second important one is protecting to see that your other family members don't get the infection the second important thing is to see that you don't deteriorate so you must always stay in touch with your doctor you must monitor your oxygen saturation if your oxygen saturation starts falling below 95 that it is 94 or less then you must immediately consult your doctor or go to the hospital if you develop any symptoms which are atypical you start having severe headache you feel drowsy or there's uh, diarrhea uh, then you must consult your doctor and again must go to the hospital so home isolation two things are important protecting others and making sure that you are able to pick up the warning signs so that you can reach hospitals before you deteriorate too much. Another trend that we have seen um, at places is people, although they use a mask, but they put down their masks. And in fact, at security points and checks at workplaces, even at private institutions and, and several places, uh, for security purposes, etc., they are sort of required to pull the mask down, then it ultimately dilutes the entire purpose of wearing a mask. So how do one wear a mask and what is it that one should keep in mind while wearing a mask and uh, I mean what should be the, the, the what, what should be the factors which one should keep in mind? So I think if you have to pull your mask down it should be done when you're having good amount of physical distancing and in an area where there is good cross ventilation so that you don't inhale the virus. Therefore if you're doing it at a security point it's a little dangerous thing to do you must find an alternate way. When we wear a mask, we must make sure that it's a tight fit. What is the aim of the mask? The aim of the mask is that whatever we breathe in comes through the mask and gets filtered. If your mask is loose and when you breathe in, when we breathe in, we create a negative pressure. We actually suck air into our lungs. If we create a negative pressure and the mask is not tight, then air will get sucked in from the side from the area between our nose and the mask, from the area between our cheeks, or if the mask is loose from below, from the area below our chin. And if air comes in from those sides without going through the mask, it will not be protecting us. So a mask has to fit tightly around your nose and face. It should cover your chin properly in a tight manner. When you wear your mask, when you're going out, once you wash your hands, make sure that it's tight around your nose, there is no gap in at, on the cheeks and at the below the chin it is also fitting in tightly if you are not doing that then you are not wearing your mask properly and it's very important that we may wear our mask properly and avoid having to pull it down in at places uh, like these if you have to do it you have to then develop a mechanism of some sort of an isolation area which has a good exhaust fan and people can then come one by one there put their mask down get them identified and move out rather than doing it in a in an open area and increasing the chance of infection. Right. Now, um, a question that a lot of people are asking, although it's a very broad question and it, it's, it's on a uh, uh, policy level, but what do you think, sir, between work from home and, and the unlock that is uh, now in place? Should one avoid going to a workplace as far as possible or do we now need to come to a point where we, we start moving things? So, so what should IDD be done to strike a balance? Because, I mean, it's very difficult to, to take a call uh, uh, to do. If I bring so like you, like you said, you have to really strike a balance. And you must make sure that your workplace is safe and non-essential people or people who can actually stay uh, at home and work from home don't come. So we have that in our hospital, our research staff, if they don't need to come, they work from home. They can stay in touch with the, uh, the supervisor uh, and uh, they don't need to come. Our PhD students also don't need to come every day. They can do their work from home. If they have to do an experiment, they can block a time so that they are doing it alone. There's not too much of uh, people in the lab. And that type of strategy can be developed. We are not talking of developing what we call, we are all calling a new normal or a new way of working. For many months, we will have to develop a strategy where we are safe and where we can still continue to have work being done, the economy opening up and being able to provide, being able to provide 
for uh, the uh, livelihood and work uh, not suffering but at the same time making sure that we are protected so like i said physical distancing we need to work on that in offices also we can develop an office uh, movement where you have one entry point and one exit so that there is no cross of crossing of people you enter from one door and you exit from the other door you can sit zig in a zigzag manner so that you are not uh, closed uh, just facing each other you can put uh, uh, barriers which could be plastic or glasses around your uh, office space so that again you there is some sort of a barrier and infection doesn't spread there has to be good cross ventilation either the ac duct has to be open so that fresh air comes in or windows should be open luckily now we have gone through the peak of summer so we should be able to keep our windows open without too much of uh, uh, heat and therefore these are measures that we need to take we need to be innovative this is a time where it's challenging uh, for us to see how can we innovate so that our work is done economy also moves at the same time we are able to protect each other so striking a fine balance is the need of the hour you make an assessment of how many people are required in an office how much is the workforce uh, essential to remain present in the office and how many people can work from home so that sort of a mixed balance is required uh, uh, a question which is two fold sir one is a lot of patients are are allergic to certain basic medicines like paracetamol etc so they do talk about uh an inhalation therapy where they take steam etc and you mentioned that i mean uh, gargles or or maybe having hot water may not be a full proof uh, cure as such but how is uh, uh, steam effective in in dealing with the virus and and especially for those patients who are allergic to certain drugs so if you are allergic to certain drugs like you said fever medication you can always find some one which are suitable to you some asthmatics are allergic to what we call non steroid anti inflammatory drugs drugs like aspirin and we also advise them to take other drugs there are a lot of home remedies which may help these include steam inhalation these include gargling these include a lot of uh, things that we use like turmeric uh, that people use at home or other uh, uh, home remedies um uh, using of uh, harmful or uh, they are of not no of no use i'm just saying that we don't have enough data we can use them but we should not say that this is the only treatment that we'll do if we have an illness we must use this as some to, as a strategy to complement whatever else is needed to fight the virus a herbal remedy is ayurvedic treatment is, is i mean something which can complement the existing allopathic uh, treatment that we are still trying to figure out uh, uh, i mean what it is so all these are something which we can try but i mean as you rightly said it it is something which will unfold as we we move ahead but correct uh, yeah so my next question sir is uh, it's an important question from the point of view of uh, pregnant women those who are pregnant at, at this point what special precautions do they need to take and and uh, what are the things that they should keep in mind particularly if they are to deliver during this time and also the the entire period of their pregnancy so we had a lot of concern as far as pregnancy was concerned because when we had swine flu h1n1 one group which was at a very high risk was pregnant women data as of now does not suggest that the pregnant women for covid are at a very high risk they have to take all the precautions because pregnancy itself is a situation where your immunity is altered therefore pregnant women i would advise them to not mixing with too many people and at the same time monitoring themselves closely for any other symptoms uh, the challenge that we faced at times and we had to do this very early in march is when you have a pregnant women who comes on term and is covid positive so the whole issue of managing pregnancy whether it is delivery or doing a cesarean section wearing ppe is was a new challenge that we had early in the phase of the pandemic we had to form a separate operation theater or separate labor room but the outcome is usually good in such individual in such a preg positive pregnant women we will also test the new nate and there is really not much data no data to really show that there is significant transmission of the virus from the mother to the fetus or the newborn but we and uh, breastfeeding is also safe so mothers may not worry that much but they have to make sure that they can protect themselves by 
the preventive measures that I highlighted uh, in my talk. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there is time constraint, so we'll just take very short last couple of questions, sir. Uh, one is in respect of uh, the food that people eat. I mean, is there something which they should do in their diet to include certain types of foods? And people, in fact, have faced difficulties in managing their food, uh, as, as we discussed. But the specific question is in respect of certain dietary practices which one may include uh, in, in their daily uh, food to boost their immunity. So what kind of food would that be? So my advice is that, you know, uh, you must, first of all, uh, have a good balanced diet, healthy food, green leafy vegetables, fresh fruit. When you get uh, fr um, uh, vegetables from outside, clean them properly with warm water and wash your hands once you've done that. And similarly, if you have carrying uh, paper bags, dispose them off. So what you could do is just outside, uh, just as you enter your house or just outside the house, have a table out there where you, whatever you get from outside, you clean it out there, uh, wash your hands and then bring it inside. And then whatever you are using as a cover or as a paper bag or a bag to bring your uh, food, you dispose it off properly. But the food itself is good. You should have a good balanced diet. Uh, there is a lot of data which suggests that now with people becoming more focused on good healthy diet, a lot of other illnesses which we would see, which was non-communicable diseases, sugar control, or blood pressure control have also become better. But there's really no definite uh, diet that I would say. People do take a lot of multivitamin, vitamin C, zinc, because some data suggests that that helps to boot, boost your immunity. There's also some data which suggests that vitamin D supplement is also useful because that may also help as a, to boost your immunity and may help you to fight the viral infection. So supplements can be taken, vitamin D can be taken, but there's no special diet that you need to take. You must take a good diet. And lastly, sir, um, when do we see an end to this in the sense, I mean, we know it's very difficult to say and with a lot, a lot of vaccine candidates uh, out there. And I mean, there's still no clarity as such as to when can we expect a vaccine and how will that be administered? And it's a huge task ahead of us. But uh, where do you see this headed uh, in the sense? So this is a big challenge. And I think how it, the, the pandemic will behave in the next few months is dependent on how we behave. Because if we are able to maintain physical distancing, if we're able to maintain wearing a mask, we will see a decrease in number of cases. And this has been shown in various parts of the world. You've seen that there are very few cases now in Vietnam, in Taiwan, in South Korea. And this is not because they have a vaccine. It's because they were able to do all of these, these things correctly. And there was a lot of uh, citizen involvement. So if you're able to do that, we will see a decrease in number of cases. If you don't do that, the pandemic will stretch on for another few months before we a large number of us get infected and then the cases will come down. The challenge with the vaccine is, like you said, first of all, we have to have a vaccine which is safe and efficacious, and we have to have data to really show that this is a safe vaccine and effective vaccine. But the biggest challenge is distribution. How do we produce so many large doses? How do we produce so many large doses of syringes, needles, trained personals to give the vaccine? How do we have a very effective cold chain so that the vaccine reaches the remotest part of the country? And then we make a priority list who should get the vaccine first. Everyone will not get the vaccine on day one. Some will get it on the first month, some may get it six months later. How do we decide who will be able to get it at which at the, a given point in time? A lot of work and this has already started, but I think this is also a big challenge that the country is going to face. Absolutely. And it was a pleasure interacting with you, sir. And, and, and thank you so much for taking out time today and, uh, and I mean, joining uh, us on this platform. And in fact, uh, I would like to invite you to Dev Sanskriti University, about which we had shown a video at the starting. And there is a lot of uh, uh, work that is going on in terms of combining the ancient wisdom with, with modern science. And in fact, uh, Harshwatukji, uh, Shripad Naikji, they've been to uh, DSVV and they've, they've shown encouragement to the institution and, and we look forward to your guidance and support uh, whenever possible to do such good work for the society. 
and if you think that we can be of any use uh, dia volunteers because all of us are professionals who take time out of their personal and professional lives and and do these endeavors try to do our bit so if you think that we can be of some help please do reach out to us or let us know sir and please do try and visit uh, uh, the university once whenever that is this pandemic is over and uh, i mean things are conducible uh, for for travel so on that note i would like to thank you sir thank you to all the participants and especially those organizations who have supported us in the gyan sabha endeavor all throughout law informants podar college district 3141 rotaract uh, advocate bala saheb apte college of law uh, vidyanidhi uh, all all these organizations who have helped us and next week we'll have another uh, uh, prominent personality with us uh, tushar gandhi ji uh, uh, who will be talking to us uh, on on gandhian principles and this this is standard time for gyan sabha every sunday at 4:30 pm we have been organizing this ever since the pandemic broke and we try to bring people from different walks of life to have their uh, views on on uh, activities which impact our nation as such and there is another uh, endeavor which, which we have started under the guidance of dr pranav pandya ji every evening from 6:20 to 6:30 we all of us collectively chant prayers for the well being of mankind and humanity we chant gayatri mantra you can join this and and say whatever prayer you wish to from 6:20 to 6:30 so that all the covid warriors out there and and all those people who are infected uh, or or have suffered a loss they get strength because prayers always have collective uh, powers so with that note sir and, and, and all the thank you thank you and i would like to definitely pay a visit to your center i really appreciate the work that you're doing and i think we all need to come together and work as a team and there is a lot of good thing that india has which we need to show the world so i think this is what your foundation is doing and i would be a pleasure to be part of it thank you very much thank you so much sir in fact you are already a part of it sir you have come to this platform and and uh, uh, i mean we will look forward to your further support and guidance so thank you so much sir So I uh, invite everyone to uh, uh, say Shanti Path with me. This is for again uh, the well-being of all the mankind. Om Jyo Shanti Ranta Rikshagvam Shanti Hi Prithvi Shanti Rapa Ha Shanti Roshudha Ya Ha Shanti Hi Vanaspata Ya Ha Shanti Rvishve Deva Shanti Brahma Shanti Sarvagvam Shanti Shanti Rev Shanti Hi Shama Shanti Revi ओम शांति 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 सर्वारिष्ट सुशातिर्भवत थैंक यू एवरी वन थैंक यू